getting the extras ready was um, undertaken by my supervisor, Rosemary Burrows, who created these extraordinary costume villages. Um, now it's um, with these bigger epics that have been happening subsequently, it's um, par for the course, but at the time I think we were the first. I get information from the designer as to what she wants, she does the designs, we find people to make it, as far as the crowd is concerned, and then it's the logistics of actually setting the whole thing up to make it work. Well, they're brought in at that far end in batches, otherwise we have a major stampede. And they're all issued with a number. And that number, they go to the right section along the rail where their costume is hanging either side here. And they are given their costume. They then go into the center section, change, and we have a buddy system where they help one another because we don't have enough staff. And then they bring us back their costume, which we hang on their number section down the rail. And then they come to a little quality control end here where they're checked before they go and hit the mud bath. We really wanted chain mail. Chain mail is kind of like linked metal tunic in a way. And there's a, a cheat kind of chain mail that you can get that's knitted and then you silver it and really didn't want it. It looked phony. And to do it as metal, I mean, you couldn't get the guys to walk in it. It's far too heavy. So someone said, well, why don't we do it in aluminium? And then you have to get aluminium to look old. So you have to dip it in acid. But then we couldn't find anybody for the price to make us a hundred suits. And in the end, we found a gentleman up north. He's called Yorkshire Forge. But we suddenly discovered that besides putting shoes on horses, he also makes S&M clothes. So Mr. Kinky from S&M has made the chain mail. The logistics are more difficult on this one for the simple reason that we finish shooting here and immediately go to Morocco. So the logistics of having to try and set up Morocco and not being able to take anything from here because Morocco is instant, it's the day after. And the same thing as that we leave Morocco and are instantly in Malta. So the amount of trafficking and custom sheets of what goes here, where and how, and how many days it takes to get it there, plus the fact we have hired stuff from Rome. And so all the footwear has come from Rome. And we had to have thousands of boots made for this. Maximus starts off as a general. Um, so from an armour point of view, he needed to be quite stupendous, but not flash. He needed to be grand, but not overbearing. So we basically upgraded his armour by just adding a little bit of gold here and there, and adding wolf fur. And then, of course, when he is captured, you need to see him go down to the very basic and then he starts off wearing very basic, th thin leather uh, armor when he starts his first, second fights. And then he inherits the breastplate of um, Oliver Reed. And if you look at the breastplate, you will see he adds to it as he wins more and more fights. He adds another silver figure to his breastplate involving his family, the tree of life, all of Russell's um, armour was made for him to ride easily, to fight easily, um, for the stunt fighters to fight easily, to facilitate every kind of um, action. Apart from the Praetorian Guard, who had to look as if they buffed their armour every day, because um, they were escorting the Emperor and the Emperor's family all the time. And then in Rome, we had um, a specific brief to go pastel for the civilians, to go Alma Tadema was um, our influence on uh, the Roman crowd and he was a romantic painter in late 19th century and his concepts of Rome are fabulous. Very pistachio pink, pale blue, dove grey, lovely light silk colours. 
it's amazing. I mean, you look for for an actor. The minute I put this on, you just feel like you're in a completely different world. Um, and it's been kind of fantastic exploring that, yet making it feel natural, like it's ours. Um, and, you know, the first time I, I call them my curtains, uh, because uh, this just kind of curtain. But uh, you're putting that on and, and just and wearing it as if it's uh, you know blue jeans. Commodus is obviously. Um emperor in waiting so he had the richest fabrics he had fabulous shot silks he had hand embroidery he had um, three sets of armor one of which was a sort of working armor which you see in germania which he would have been traveling in the second was a show armor whereby he'd be opening the games and the third one which is the marbleized armor was an inspiration of ridley's from a statue to actually bring this veined marble into reality. This uh, crest is, is the, um, it's the armor of the Praetorian Guard, um, which is essentially like the Secret Service. And, um, and I have no idea why I'm wearing it. You said it was an absolute joy to dress because Connie has the figure of a supermodel. So I had already um, purchased a lot of fabulous fabric. Um, we were going a lot for shot silks and shot silk satins and a lot of um, embroidery and hand embroidery. And uh, when we were able to get together, we draped all these bolts of fabric over her and wrapped them round and she was very involved in it as well. And when I showed the photos to Ridley, he went, well, there you are, you, you don't, you've got it. Because we hadn't even started making. They have made these incredible, they are all uh, hand embroidered, uh, they're handmade. They, the jewels are made spe especially for um, this, uh, this film. This is a, a real one. I, I bought this one in, a, in an antique store. It's a 2,000 year old ring, signet ring. And I, it comforts me to think that someone wore this a long time ago around the same period that we were, we were in. I had the most wonderful cutter, Annie Hadley, who also created some fabulous looks for her. And in actual fact, although I can't give you the exact amount of appearances, we had something like 18 to 20 outfits. However, we managed to get um, nearly every fabric purchased on her body at some point or another, what with seven or eight components in each outfit, from veils to cloaks to draping to tunics, etc. Oliver Reed was the best fun to design for because he knew his character and he liked to run with it. So when he's in his armor, he's got a little bit more swagger. It's leather, got a bit of a sort of devil may care feel about it. We were able to put together, again, my cutter, Annie Hadley, put together some wonderful gel gelibers in bright colors. And we were able to dress him up with the maddest of jewelry to give him this sort of completely over the top Eastern dealer, wheeler dealer really, which is what he was. Everything had to be different when we arrived in Morocco because, of course, all the extras were completely differently clothed. They were in Moroccan gelibers, they were, but of their time. Nowadays, if you asked 2,000 or 3,000 extras to turn up in their gelibers, they would probably be wearing Nike trainers and uh, the gelibers would be bright green. So we would have, we had to dress every, every single extra. And again, Rosemary created this wonderful costume village in the middle of the desert. Marcus Aurelius obviously being emperor had to have the best of all things and he had handmade armor in metal and leather. He loved everything about it. He felt, he said, he felt very magisterial wearing it. And as I visited him a couple of times, um, obviously for fittings, he loved to live in pajamas. So anything long and robe-like, he was very happy with. This is the Roman Caraz, which uh, being that I'm a high military man of rank, it's very elaborate, it has lions, it has various things. This is, this is a ribbon, which signifies a rank. 
They had different colored ribbons for different ranks. I have my sword, the Praetorian sword, because it's purple, which was the color of royalty. These are armor to protect your forearms, armor to protect your ankles. This is the ring which symbolizes the, the office, which was a seal. It's an eagle, which always symbolizes Rome. The senators, um, of whom Derek Jacobi, of course, was the leader, we used a richer fabric than has been used before. We also lined them in black instead of um, the senatorial burgundy. And uh, so therefore their togas and their tunics were thicker and richer, but they did stand out in that they were a little more richly draped in, uh, in fabric. Coming to Tiger's armor, um, Ridley had a vision of a, a helmet that would lift. It was based on a French fireman's helmet that the visor lifts on, and then it was carved, um, originated beautifully um, by our armor makers. He has claws as his shoulder guards, he has claws, and he has tiger's heads on the top of his uh, greaves to protect his knees. And uh, he basically actually was such a fine figure of a man, he did the rest for us. The Maltese uh, extras were quite fun to work with. They would turn up with various eyebrows pierced and they wouldn't take off their Ray-Bans or <laughs> Rolex watches. So we had to go on crowd um, scanning on a daily basis to <laughs> remove, again, trainers and uh, various bits and bobs. I'm sure you'd be able to see one or two if you scan the crowd. One always felt one was experiencing something very special filming Gladiator because it hadn't been done for such a long time and also one could see what Ridley was putting on the screen and it was just stunning. battles is easy, you, know, you work out five different kinds of battles with the good stuntmen, good stunt coordinators. It's the stuff in between that makes it organic. That's the hard stuff. Sort of. You fucking there was a lot of tension. I mean, Russell was a committed actor in the same way that, that Ridley's a committed director. These people, when they make movies, they make movies. They're not goofing around. A little battered and bruised and scratched. I don't actually think that there's one part of my body that hasn't had some kind of uh, physical rupture. Much of the work in the arena was very backbreaking. Not only do we have 5,000 extras, animals, people in heavy costumes, but in the middle of that day, we were also evolving the script. Battle of the Front had to be all quiet on the Western Front, realistic, brutal, not glorious. They won, but it was filthy. And you didn't feel like, as of course Marcus always points out, you'd actually accomplished anything except to kill more people. He spent 16 out of his 20 years as emperor out fighting battles and killing people and spilling blood and expanding the empire. Has come to a time now when he thinks it's, his life was a failure. And he actually has ruined his children. There's nobody left to fight, sir. Ah, there's always someone left to fight. 
this Germania sequence, initially, you know, we were looking to use, obviously, a large amount of troops for that. So there was a lot of talk about shooting that sequence at the beginning and plans to maybe go to Eastern Europe. I went to Bratislava first to, because I was promised great forests there, which they were. I wanted these great, great forests. And then I suddenly, I realized, I made the decision not to go to Bratislava. I said, because here we are starting a huge movie and I'm moving this entire unit to build a Roman camp in a wood where no one's been there before and everyone's going to be complaining about the food and the laundry. So I said, let's keep it in the UK, drive day from London. Um, let's start looking around London. There we just got lucky. The, it was a London-based production, and we looked around London, and we found a forest that was about to be deforested. So uh, unlike the normal environmental regulations, they welcomed us to come in and destroy some of their trees. The forest was on sandy ground, so they wanted to actually burn it to the ground because the trees looked at us and I said, how old are these trees? 30 years old? He said, no, that's the problem. They've been in here 70 years and they're stunted. So I took over an entire valley that was going to be decimated. So we went in and I actually had the blessing of the Forestry Commission and, you know, we didn't do a lot of burning, but reporters getting on it saying, we're burning the forest, all that bullshit. They don't, they never get anything right. They always try and turn everything into a confrontation. Actually, we think, are we stupid? We've actually gone through the whole process of the Forestry Commission, who said, be my guest, get it, rid of it. So we cut trees down, made palisades and infrastructure and the trenches of the Romans, and uh, I had a field day. Consequently, I never moved a unit more than 300 yards during the first month. Three weeks, three and a half weeks. That's how, how I was able to get everything. So the battle scene was only done 150 meters from the interior of the tents. So I move up the hill at night when it gets too dark because it was January. So you, you lose your light, it, your meat is gone at f four o'clock. So I, I move inside the tents. You arrive and you come over these hills and all of a sudden like you see like this fort, that is, like this Roman fort it looks like the kind of place when you were like, you know, at camp. <laughs> it was like your dream to be in a place like that, you know, and it was incredibly beautiful. And we, and then it was like taken down to see Ridley, uh, was shooting some of those opening scenes that are incredible. And it's just smoke going everywhere and fires burning and thousands of extras like, you know, and you can see like these troop movements. And I'm just like, just overwhelmed because it looks amazing. And then he's there and he's just calm. And he's just looking at all those different monitors from all those different cameras. And then you like to, well, move that on that one and get that part of that tunic in that corner. And he's calm. And then, you know, always that grin and like that, you know, thing in the eye, sort of like, you know, that says, you know, good humor about it. I'll use that somewhere else in the bloody battle, somebody else on fire. This is fantastic. Great. Fantastic. How's that? Always got to be sprayed. Yeah. 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 So fast. The speed we shot this film was pretty quick. The whole German front, which included all of the scenes in the tents with Marcus Aurelius and, and, and Maximus walking around the camp and his first encounter with Lucilla and Marcus Aurelius meeting with his, his ne'er-do-well son, telling him he would not be emperor. The near assassination, the ride out into freedom, was all done in three weeks. That included all, the whole German front, all the German battles and everything. So we did that in like three weeks and three days. Bring the Praetorian group over behind here with me. For me, logistically, it was uh, you know, one of the best challenges I've had, I think, the most enjoyable challenges I've had as an AD. Richard, what have you got left in the tent now, Richard? We're an hour and a half outside London and we need the Roman army and we need the Celtic army or the, German, the Germanian army. That was a period of time where we actually started our own, you know, employment agency to facilitate getting these people. We had open calls, open casting, newspaper adverts to try and, you know, to cast this army. And then alongside, you know, Billy Dowd, who works in crowd casting, and a guy called Rob Martin, who worked with us on the movie, we managed to, you know, create our own Roman army made up of, you know, unemployed chaps and students and various people who were willing to work for 60, 70 pounds a day and for about for a very long day. So we started this process going and we, um, we you know, created the army, we fitted the army. I think at one time we had about sort of 800 extras 
um, of which we would we would select about 20 special uh, extras, the ones that look the best. But we, you know, once we got into the battle, we would have to be more selective and, and, and work out what wounds we were going to have on certain people, work out with the stunt arrangers how the stunts were going to work, and also to work on the site, we had to move all our stuff, you know, literally around the cameras that we could then apply makeup as we were shooting it, um, because there just wasn't time to take people back to the, uh, the tents. Well, we're in at four o'clock this morning to make a start, just to get them all on set for 7.15. So they spread them out, basically, so you've got about 100, and they're changing at a time. They probably take about half an hour from when they walk in and get their costume issued, get changed, go on through to hair and makeup. We had a pretty big workforce. I think I had about, there must have been makeup and hair wise, we had about um, 20 additional on the, on the big crowd days. And um, we had a lot of prosthetic people. We had about sort of six prosthetic people that were working on the floor full time. <laughs> Day, on average, you try to get about 15 people in to help us, um, but we've only got 13 today, but it's ample, it's fine, and um, so it should all get done in time. We mostly, most of our work's done on the Germans rather than the Romans, because they put their hats on. We're just back home in it and coating it in wax so that it looks dirty and grimy as he plays a barbarian German. How are we going? Yeah, you're going really well at the moment. Uh, the, all the Germans are near enough through, we've about 10 left. And I'm sending bolts of Romans through because there's three makeup girls gone up. So yeah, we're in good shape. And what time? Because we, we've got seven o'clock arrivals coming. Uh, so once they're all changed, actually, I just send a lot of them all up. The biggest challenge for me on this picture, I think, would have been the battle, because it was it was unknown. It was having a thousand men fight sort of 700 barbarians. Um, and we didn't know what our breakages would be, how many days we were going to carry on doing it, and that's where we made up most of our weapons. Where are they at the moment? Where are the amputees at the moment? And then, you know, in a short period of about four days, we train the army to fire arrows, march in squares, and form the tortoise as the shape of Roman army units. You had to stand here for us. Try and thin this area out with some Romans. We bring up the uh, 60, 70 Felix with up. cuts and wounds. We dress them Sorry, in. Sorry, I just. It was a very enjoyable, exciting process, especially the first day when you stood on location and looked up the hill and saw, you know, 500 Roman legion marching down in sort of rough formation towards the set. It was a pretty cool experience. I had 50 special extras along with sort of 30 or so stunt guys or stunt special extra type guys. So um, what I did was I choreographed six routines that I taught the extras. So I'd start off, I'd bring, at one group I'd teach routine A, the next group I'd teach routine B, C, D, E and F, so on. So, and so that I had at least six variations of routines going on, so I could always call on, right, you guys I want over here, I want an A routine here, a B routine there, a C there, put a D there, put an A there, but switch it, so that there was variety, but they always knew what they were doing, and then within that, any of the good ones, I'd let improvise a little, and on top of the routine I gave them. We had to go through all the choreography of the German front, where that battle runs for 13 minutes, right? That's a lot of sword play. Also, you're on horseback. You're on a charger, so then the charger is brought down halfway during the battle. So now he's on his feet. So that's a lot of choreography about what you're doing, so you don't get your nose broken on your head taken off. Now the wolf, he, uh, another guy's coming in here now to get Russell. The wolf gets this guy. No problem. Come in. Russell gets up. Carry on. Carry on. Oh. Oh. Wolf, wolf fighting. Double here. Wolf fighting. Right. The next guy. Now can we? 
literally kill him rather than punching him. We need to see an insertion. Then he punches him back and then he slashes him as he gets better. Well, I think you need to do something really brutal, like chop his fucking head off something. Yeah. That's the thing with Ridley, that he does, he, he loves the reality of it all. He doesn't want to pretend to do anything. He, he wants to, he really wants to make it feel as though this was what it was like. I spent the first couple of days of the production um, with the crew in England during the shooting the battle sequences, which were usually done with three or four cameras. Now, usually the fourth camera, you're telling a, an operator, well, just get me some close-ups or, you know, pan across or pick up this or I want you to really play, focus on the horses or whatever. There's Ridley Scott down, like, on his belly in the mud, you know, framing his fourth camera. I mean, the, the amount of pictorial attention that Ridley pays to every shot is just extraordinary. There's no one else who's like that. So as a result, your dailies are fascinating. I have one of these terrible sort of uh, personalities where I read something uh, that I think is fascinating, so I'm going to do that, right? That's the thing I'm going to do. The practical considerations of, you know, there's the swimming sequence, you know, naked being chased by a shark. I don't think about that. <laughs> from the thing, the point of view is me. I think about it from the point of view of the character and how it fits within the story. So I never really um, consider the day-to-day -day hardships I'm about to put myself through until I'm in the middle of them. I'm saying on a long lens, I can close him up. So if Russell's here. Just step him, then have Russell here. About to kill him here. Cut. Russell had a lot to learn in terms of physical behavior, fighting. You know, which even with those swords, they're still a metal alloy. If you get clipped by that alloy, it hurts, and it'll give you a cut. So it's still dangerous, slightly dangerous. Not quite as bad as steel, but you can't have rubber swords. You know.